to you to say uh, what your name is, where you're calling from, and what organization with, and what you're working on. So, Andres, do you want to introduce yourself? Surely. Uh, my name is Andres Antonio. I am from South America, Uruguay. Uh, we are working in a new project because there is a regulation here in the country to uh, issue electronic money. So we are creating a company and considering BFOS as our platform solution. Okay, thank you for joining us today, Andres, and we're happy to you know help you become a closer part of the community and we hope to work with your team on your project. Uh, okay, Benny, thanks. do you want to introduce yourself, Benny? Sure, sure. Uh, hi, this is Benny here. Uh, I work part-time as the product manager on MIPOS and the other half of my time I do implementations of MIPOS for financial institutions, implementations and extensions. Uh, I'm dialing in from Pune in India. Okay. Uh, thanks, Benny, and glad you had enough power and connectivity today to join us. Dinyuge, do you want to give your intro? Uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm uh, DJ uh, from Sri Lanka. Uh, I work as a police officer in the and I'm working with uh, adding uh, data and code to the network. Yes. Okay, thanks, Dean Again, We're looking forward to your demo today. And Marcus, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Marcus. I'm calling from Germany and I'm a volunteer working on the platform and also mentoring for the Google Summer of Code. Okay. Uh, glad to have you on today, Marcus. And later on when we do our sort of development updates, we'll let you, you know, share with the community what you might start working on next uh, as a mentor. So. Samuel, sure. thanks. Uh, Samuel, do you want to introduce yourself? So. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Samuel Ferguson. Now I uh, work with World Relief. I'm actually kind of demoing the system. I'm trying to get a, a sense for uh, how well MIFOS might work for uh, two MFIs, particularly uh, you know, based in Central Africa, in uh, DRC and in Burundi. That's my primary interest. Okay. And where are you based today? Um, I'm sorry. I'm in upstate New York. Okay. Well, thanks, Samuel. Uh, glad you were able to, to join us today. And then I think we have a couple other folks that will be joining pretty soon, but we'll just let them introduce themselves when they come onto the call. Uh, my name is Ed. Uh, I help uh, manage the community and run the MIFOS initiative, the nonprofit guiding our platform and community, and I'm based out of California. So the first item we had on the agenda was just to give some updates on recent development happening uh, on the platform. And Benny, since I have you on the call today, I might let you give a quick update on development and the date for our next release that the community can look, look forward to. And I can add in anything where you'd like me to as well, Benny. But. Yep, sure. Uh, so we have been working on uh, one, two features, two main features. One is accrual accounting, uh, where we have currently what we have is the accrual accounting uh, working on the due dates of payments. And just give me a second, please. Sure, no, no worries, Benny. Sorry, I was just closing the door. Uh, yeah. So currently, what works is when the uh, installment gets due on a cert certain date, then the income is recognized, income or expense is recognized as on the due date. There are organizations which want it uh, to fall on, uh, periodically, like the end of the month or the end of the quarter, they want to recognize their income and expenses. So that feature is developed and uh, we have tested it quite a bit. The second feature what we are working on is, um, is uh, on the interest fee calculation, that is whenever a payment is early or late, uh, then the interest, currently what MIFOS offers is a static uh, repayment schedule. So what happens now is if, if a payment is either late or early, 
then the interest is recalculated according to that and uh, yeah so that that allows you to have a more realistic uh, schedule which which is followed by a lot of commercial financial institutions um, other things that we are working on Marcus would probably be able to give us give a better update on this uh, in terms of having bulk operations in terms of uh, creating multiple loans or multiple uh, approving multiple loans etc in one go which is very useful for the group lending scenario. Um, so there's a lot. There, there are a few bugs, bug fixes, and smaller features that are that we are working on, including a thousand separator during data entry uh, and display. This is useful for currencies which have very uh, where the value of the currency itself is very low, and a small loan could run. It makes data entry much more simpler. So these are a few features we are working on. I don't have the exact date on which the release will happen, but it should be in the next uh, 10 days or so. Uh, Marcus, do you want to add to anything that I just said? Yeah, I think we really should mention the um, GLG bulk loan application, right? So um, this was one of the projects for the Google Sum of Code, and um, you are now able to create a GLG loan application for a complete group and um, just add members of this group so you just can do it in a sort of a bulk operation and one of the features Vinny asked for which are very useful I think is you have some common fields that you could fill in but you're also able to override them per member of the group if you want to have some special treatments for them so that's one, one thing which is also will be there in the next release. Okay, th thank you, Benny, and uh, thank you, Marcus, for providing hey, thanks, those Marcus. updates. And then, yeah, I think on the user interface side, one of our GSOC <coughs> interns, Garov, he has a number of other UI enhancements that we're continuing to ship. And then I think on our subsequent user call, we're going to go into more detail on all the various usability and UI enhancements he worked on as they've touched a number of areas across the community app, including you know your client groups and centers, uh, default view, the home page, the breadcrumbs throughout the system. So he's done a lot on the UI that we wanted to directly demo and get some user feedback on. Were there any questions from individuals on the call about development features that are currently being worked on or might be in the roadmap or anything you're looking to see? Okay, well if there are no questions on that right now, you know, anytime you have a question or a product feature, suggestion, enhancement, bug, you, know, you can create that as a ticket in JIRA or you can also start a thread on our users mailing list to discuss that with the community and Benny or another individual will you know respond back to you to get more details or any more clarification as needed. Uh, the next item I had on today's agenda was just to briefly you know talk about our summit so I'll just bring the website up on my screen. Hopefully you've received the invitation email or you've seen details about the summit but it's going to be hosted in Kampala, Uganda from October 14th through 17th this year and registration and the scholarship processes have just opened up uh, earlier this month and then you know we're pulling together the agenda and pulling together the speakers that will be attending but at this point in time we're very much interested in hearing what types of sessions and training and content you would like to see covered at the summit so we can build that in and so it'll be a mix of sessions led by community members as well as external experts will be bringing in. But we're very much looking forward to having our summit in Africa for the first time and helping to grow and stimulate the community we have that's burgeoning in uh, East Africa right now. Are there any questions about the summit or a specific uh, topics they'd like to bring up related to it. Okay. Well, just make sure if you have any questions uh, or you're interested in attending and 
want to know more about what we're going to be going over, just reach out to me directly or any other of the leaders in the community, and we'll help you get more familiar about the summit and speak to you about how the past two have gone, which we've held in India the past two years. And so at the end of the call, we'll have a little time just for open Q&A and office hour discussion. But the majority of today's call, we wanted to focus on having some of these showcases from the work that our Google Summer of Code interns have been doing throughout the summer. So our first demo today will be from Antonio, and he's been working on the Pago Soul project. And then includes both a mobile client as well as uh, you know web app component to track uh, pay as you go and other you know transaction mod uh, modules and then Dianuge will also be demoing his work on the client and transactional data import tool so Antonio whenever you're ready I'll pass the presentation mode over to you and let you get started okay um, I'm ready to go. Okay. We'll just make sure everyone can see your screen, and then we'll let you kick off. I can see your screen now. Can others on the call see Antonio's screen? I can't see it. Okay, cool. Okay. okay. Um, so once I can figure out PowerPoint. Okay. So... Um, I just wanted to kind of give a first a, just a pretty general overview about what the project's about. Um, so as Ed uh, said, the name of the project is Pago Soul, and the big idea is that it, it's uh, going to be used to connect utilities and microfinance con uh, clients, and more specifically to facilitate payments between uh, microfinance clients and utility companies. Um, when I say utility companies, and that's a broad term, uh, the the project itself is aimed towards solar uh, solar utilities. Um, but when we were thinking about it, we were also trying to make it uh, compatible with other types of utilities as well. Um, so the main features that I was working on were uh, payments for utilities. Um, from MFI clients, client account creation for utilities, uh, and actually by utilities, and then consumption tracking of services for both the utilities and the clients. Uh, the stakeholders are the microfinance clients. Uh, their role is they consume the utilities and make advanced payments to cover future consumption. Um, and they have a Pago Soul client account with a local microfinance institution. Um, and a Pago Soul client account is a, a zero interest and no fee current account. Um, utilities are another stakeholder. They provide the utilities and uh, collect advanced payments for uh, for the consumption of those utilities. And they have an, an agent account at a microfinance institution. Um, they have employees that we can refer to as utility agents. and these agents are, I guess, parallel or, or congruent or sorry, analogous to uh, like, a, like a microfinance institution field agent. Um, so they collect cash payments on the utility's behalf, and they actually cash into a Pago Soul agent account with the local microfinance institution. And finally, the microfinance institution uh, plays the role of holding all these accounts in a MIFOS instance. Um, so, what are the software components that are that are making this work? Um, obviously, the MIFOS X backend is what's powering the microfinance institution's operations, um, and then the Pago Soul backend, which is essentially a, a MIFOS, a fork of the MIFOS uh, backend that I wrote some new classes for to build out um, the uh, additional uh, functionality f for uh, for a CRM billing and payment uh, features that utility companies can use. 
And then finally, the Pegaso Android client, which is also essentially a, a fork of the uh, Mifos X Android client um, and allows agents to create new accounts and transfer payments remotely. So how does all this stuff work? Um, for example, for the creation of a client, everything starts with the uh, agent in the field with their um, Android device. Um, so they collect their Know Your Client data. They send that to the Pago Soul instance. The Pago Soul instance creates a record for the client and then makes a post request to the Mifos backend. Uh, the Mifos backend creates a client in their data store, in its data store, and returns to the Pegosol backend instance that then requests a Pegosol account from the Mifos instance, which creates the current account, returns back to the Pegosol instance, which then sends the new client and the new Pegosol account data to the Android client. And at that point, the client is created and the, uh, the field agent can begin accepting payments for uh, that person's utilities. So how does payment processing work? Well, the agent at this point is can collect cash from a client. Um, they can initiate the transfer from their account, which is which has a, a certain amount of money that they leave the microfinance institution with. And the that gets sent to the Pago Soul backend instance, which records that transaction, sends uh, a record of it to the Mifos X backend instance. This is really like just doing a call to a savings account transfer in the in Mifos. Um, and so that transfers the uh, funds from the agent's account to the client's account and then returns to the Pegosol backend which returns to the uh, the Android client and lets the agent and the customer know that the the transaction's been completed. So uh, another problem that we were looking to solve is was billing or actually really like debiting of a Pago Soul account. Um, previously, we saw how a client gets uh, gets credits on their account. So how what happens when they consume energy? So there needs to be a a piece of hardware that can track their consumption. Um, and there are actually two models that that we discussed and we looked at um, existing products in the field that that use two different models. Basically there's kilowatt hours and then there's a like a time box. Um, so this is essentially how kilowatt hours would work. The consumption meter would talk to the Pegosol backend, um, tell it, okay, this person's used X amount of kilowatt hours. Uh, Pego, the Pegosol backend records that, creates the charge uh, or the uh, amount to be debited from the, the customer's account and sends that to the Mifos instance. Uh, that debits the client's account per the instructions that it got from the Pago Soul backend and sends an updated balance to the, to the Pago Soul backend. Um, the Pago Soul backend can also send an SMS to the client and let them know that, they're, that when their balance is low and if it's past due, it may actually send a kill signal to this piece of hardware, um, which is not just a consumption meter, but also has some kind of component, uh, like a, a con an energy control flow component. So uh, billing by time is similar, but also slightly different. Uh, again, there's some piece of hardware that's, uh, that's not only tracking the, the usage, it's also um, has some way to uh, allow or prevent energy to flow from the solar panel to, you know, to the, to the client. Um, so that will send an activation signal to the Pegasol backend. 
and uh, that will get validated by the backend instance. Then if, if it's validated, the uh, meter can begin allowing energy to flow. At that point, uh, Pegosol backend instance sends a, uh, a, a record for the beginning of the time to the uh, MIFOS backend, I'm sorry, sends the, uh, the amount to be debited from the client's account. Um, the MIFOS X backend depletes the client's account accordingly, sends an updated balance to the Pegosol backend, and after the purchased amount of time elapses, the Pago Soul backend sends a kill um, signal to the meter, and that's if the client by that time hasn't re-upped or you know bought more credit for their account, then the energy is is cut off. So the next steps that um, I want to complete or that need to be completed for this project are a UI, usage metrics tracking and reporting, um, and SMS messaging for uh, like of the low balance or, an, or a past due balance, um, and then activation and deactivation signals. So there's a bit of a question mark with these because, or at the last point, because we haven't yet been able to work with a piece of hardware that um, actually does these sort of killing, or sorry, the, uh, the, the allowing or the restricting of, of energy flow, but that's certainly a, you know, something that we can look forward to. Um, and that's that. Does anyone have any questions? Vinny, a quick question for me. Uh, for sure. capturing client uh, KYC, did you also capture the photograph using the Android device? No, um, that's, I didn't focus on that. I, I think that, like, if I remember correctly, I think that was being built out as I started um, at the beginning of the summer. Uh, but what's, what's great about how this is set up, and one of the reasons that um, you know, for example, with the Pegosol backend, I thought about just trying to create my own new Spring project from scratch, and I actually did uh, go that route for about a week or two. Um, but the great thing about having, you know, forks of both the um, Mifos Android client and both the uh, Mifos backend is that um, it should hopefully be fairly easy to import that code from uh, the Android client, the, the Mifos Android client, into into the Pegasol Android client. All right. Yeah. Thanks. I was just curious to know if it was done. Uh, someone was asking me for a similar functionality, so I was curious. So thanks. Sure. And I, I think Benny in the I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Hasn't Ishan made sure that's turned on in the just default uh, Mifos X Android client? So I haven't tested that in the last one week or so. Probably he has. I have seen a lot of uh, changes that he has done in the last few days. I haven't gone through those changes in detail yet. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think it's I think it's activated there and available. Well, this was a really helpful. Uh, presentation, Antonio. It looks like it's covering a lot, you know, both between the changes to the Mifos X backend and the creation of both the front and back end for the actual Pago Soul applications. And then, do you have any? Are you able to show any of that back end or any of the front end on it through an emulator, Antonio? Um, I I can show. I guess some of the back end code. Um, again, it's it's pretty similar to uh, to Mifos. Just as, like I said, it's it's a okay. 
you know, I, I think today, like, well, we do have some developers on the call, but since this is more the user's call, we probably don't, yeah, don't need to get too too far into the, the development details, but sure, we can if um, anybody would like to explore that. Marcus, uh, other developers, would you like Antonio to continue with more of showing some of the back-end code? No, I think um, we could skip it and maybe we could have a short round offline Okay. in the future if he feels ready. Yeah, and yeah, whenever you have the, the front-end Android client that you could showcase or demo, Antonio, we're looking forward to, to seeing that, to see it all sort of in action, at least from a you know, prototype, proof of concept point of view. For sure. Okay. But no, I'm glad we'll have this in place and you know, hopefully we can start you and James can start promoting it and we can start, you know, making some inroads into the clean energy spaces. Yeah. I that would be awesome. Okay. Well thank you, Antonio. That was a very good presentation. And so next, uh, we're going to have Dianuge, who is going to demonstrate the enhancements that he's been making to our client data import tool uh, over the past few months. And he's also you know, integrated it fully into the MIFOSX community app. So I'll pass the presentation mode over to you, Dianuge, and then I'll let you go ahead. And when you're talking, talk closely into your microphone. Dinuge, as I know, sometimes uh, your audio is a little faint and there's some background noise, so that way we'll be certain we can hear you. We're... Your your screen's not yet visible, Tianyuge, and your audio is trailing off quite a bit. So, we'll let you know as soon as we see your screen. So. Hello. Uh, I, uh, the data input Oh, Dean Yuge, have you started sharing your screen yet? Uh, no, still not able to, to see your screen just yet. So. Let me pause a moment and then I'll well let me take control and then I'll send it back to you again okay I made you presenter again Dianuge but there's still a lot of you know just your voice is very muffled now Well, Dean, oh, can you still hear me, Dean Uge? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. 
Uh, no, your your audio still is pretty bad, Dean Yuge, and your your screen's not visible. So I think we might yeah. uh, we might need to maybe postpone your demo if we can't. Hello. Yeah, I can still hear you, Dean Yuge, slightly. So. Okay, your screen is visible now. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you slightly now. It's a lot better, so. Uh, okay. uh, I'm doing the I work uh, with uh, adding a new function now to the new process. Uh, I think uh, data encoding functionalities. Uh, 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 you can, uh, can you can see the can you see the second region on this screen? Yeah, we can see the screen, the new game. Yeah. I think just try and talk as loudly as you can into your microphone and as slowly as you can. And that way, we'll be able to optimize okay. the sound. So. Uh, hi. Uh, uh, I am uh, working with the data import tool uh, for Unicosets. Uh, uh, there was uh, another data import tool uh, previously developed, but it was a uh, standalone application. Uh, although uh, we are continuing to work on uh, developing an uh, integrated data import tool to the Unicosets. And uh, uh, let's see why we need uh, data import tool. Uh, when we uh, set up everything from the beginning, uh, you may not uh, uh, need to uh, import, uh, input data by one by one. So, uh, you can have a bulk uh, importing from using a uh, template, uh, Excel template, so you can enter a piece of uh, extra data and everything set up uh, by IT uh, set. So uh, that's what the important, uh, importance of the data import tool. So uh, how it works, uh, actually uh, data import tool uh, uses Excel template templates for everything. Uh, uh, if you want to uh, import clients, there will be a, a predefined uh, Excel template. You can fill it out uh, for each, uh, uh, each data set and you can import that data. Uh, so that's how the data import tool works. So uh, uh, in the old uh, data import uh, tool, the standard application there was uh, uh, several functions enabled, uh, the client importing and also group uh, importing and stuff importing and stuff, but uh, some of the parts were outdated. And in the new uh, developed importing tool, uh, there's uh, almost uh, uh, everything uh, is uh, developed uh, for for new setup. Uh, you can uh, actually have a new uh, importing function like uh, office importing, staff importing, uh, the system administration related importing. So uh, and a uh, lot of stuff will be there uh, in the uh, new importing tool. So uh, I'll uh, I'll. Uh, you are demo on how to use and uh, where I will be uh, where I will do the in the mini project. So uh, yeah, uh, uh, this uh, my log 
locally set up on to demo the mipo six uh, the data importing uh, function is uh, presented in under admin system so you need to go there you can uh, there you can browse the importing facilities uh, the users the staff importing users clients uh, most of these are implemented uh let's see uh, uh let's see if we, uh, we want to import clients we have uh we have a client importing specific uh UI. so there you can get the template uh get the template and fill it out and uh, you can upload the template so here you can uh, I'll give you one and you can get the template so download in the template so there will be a excel predefined template for uh, each important tool important function so there is where you can uh, select from each data and uh, you have to provide the uh, names and uh, And you can um, save the template or you can add the uh, save it uh, as much as you can. And you can browse the template so after the template submission you will be redirected to this filler uh, window so there in here you can uh, this one the imported data will be added uh, to the new text so uh, in the importing tool there will be a uh, lot of features available for uh, savings account creation transaction and uh, all of that uh, and also you can uh, browse the importing function in the uh, each relevant uh, item so let's, let's say if you want to import client you can see the importing links in the client and go to group you can see the import is here also uh, yeah uh, that will be uh, pretty much the importing tool and uh, and uh, I'll be uh, uh, I will hear if you have any suggestions of uh, how it's involved and if you have any questions on what the project Yeah, thank you, Dean Yuge. Were there uh, any questions from people? Uh, I, I think we were able to hear most everything you were presenting, Dean Yuge, but for those who would like to see more of the import tool, we're going to have a public demo server of it up very soon, and I think that'll you know, really show the full power and the broad scope of functionality that is included in it. So Dean Yuge, you know, let everyone know when that's available, but that'll be a nice way to test it out on your own and you know see how easy it is to use these predefined templates in bringing in all sorts of data into to MIFOSX. 
Yeah, it, uh, I was uh, working uh, on the uh, the demos. Uh, okay, we're looking forward to seeing that. Do you get? Uh, probably, yeah. Uh, okay. Probably in the beginning of next week, uh, I will be able to present the demos. Okay. Well, very, very good. So, well, thank you to both Antonio and Dianouye for their demonstrations today. Uh, they, along with all of our Google Summer of Code interns, have done a wonderful job this summer. And you've seen, you know, some of their other work that's been demoed. Some of it you'll see that's already been shipped in the code base. So we'll, you know, on a subsequent user call, demonstrate a few more of the functionalities. So just to recap what else has been worked on. So Ishan has already demonstrated a couple of times the functionality in our native Android client. And then like I touched on earlier, Gaurav has been making a range of enhancements to the user interface. And then Chana will be doing a demonstration uh, in the upcoming week or subsequent week of the client impact portal, which will provide nice charts and views for external stakeholders into client uh, data across multiple organizations. And then, you know, Marcus touched on the bulk GL JLG loan applications and other operations that were enabled by the work that Rishab did for batch APIs. And then our final project is led by Oleg, and that's a ad hoc query builder to make uh, reporting easier for management and other end users of the system and Oleg will also be demonstrating that to the community this upcoming week. And I see that you had a question about chart of accounts, Patrick. Uh, Dean Uge, or Yeah, well both Benny and yeah. Patrick had that question so I'll let you address that. So. Uh, yeah, uh, Patrick, uh, the importing of Chart of accounts uh, also will be uh, available in the data input tool uh, in, in, uh, in this uh, tool. Uh, but uh, chart of account uh, is being developed currently, uh, so uh, it, it, is, it is still not available, but it will be available uh, probably in the next week. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, that content will be available in the data input tool. Yeah. Thank you, Dean Yuge. I think that's yeah something that many users have been requesting. So that's a very nice feature in the data import tool. Uh, okay. Okay. I uh, uh, probably uh, uh, we can uh, next uh, next week uh, you can uh, test it uh, with the chart of uh, the comps. So uh, I'll uh, I'll be uh, working on it. Okay. Well, good. So we'll. Uh, thank you. Thanks. So Patrick, we'll get you set up with D New So next week you can begin testing that. Okay. So we've got about uh, 10 to 12 minutes left on today's call that we could use for any questions or open discussion that folks would like to have. So the floor is completely open to any topics, whether it be you know just questions you have about the community or the software in general, or if you have more specific uh, support or technical related questions. Uh, Dean Uge, Benny, did you see the request or just the question that Andres had posted there about previewing the data before it actually gets imported so uh, yeah uh, I'm not uh, sure about the exact question but uh, I think uh, uh, in the data importing uh, the idea yeah, will be not uh, 
uh, actually signed uh, signed validation for their uh, sort of validation. So when you uh, when you uh, importing the data uh, by each uh, each uh, data set, uh, the user sets that then will be provided the feedback whether it is uh, a valid set or not. Uh, by uh, its feedback uh, the uh, template with the data uh, you can uh, if you are uh, if you added the wrong uh, data set uh, you will be uh, having a re-upload uh, template with uh, with uh, invalid data set so, yeah uh, currently uh, data duplication uh, will be not uh, taking the data import tool as uh, uh, the MIFOSIC uh, uh, will not uh, will uh, not taking currently so some uh, part of the uh, application uh, uh, if you are if you are uh, adding a uh, office uh, you will be uh, taking for duplication so but you are uh, you are adding a client uh, there is you no know, uh, thing for duplication because uh, you can have a client with same name so there will be a checking uh, uh, what the text uh, are available in the new uh, is it's also available for the data import so uh, okay. and this uh, I think uh, uh, Answer your question. Anything else? Yeah, we'll try and send you, Andres, the documentation on you know just the general uh, data validations and deduplication checks that are present at the back end for MIFOSX. And like Dianuge said, those are what are being you know utilized by the data import tool. So. Yeah, to add to that, uh, at a high level we have duplicate checks for uh, identifiers like your passport number or your national identifier and uh, your external IDs, that is identifiers used in external applications yeah. other than MIFOS X and uh, yeah. I think the telephone number is there. So these checks are done at the platform level but not at the tool level. So the tool level just passes yeah. on the data to the backend and the backend validates it. And ah, if there yeah. is an error, if there is an error, there are about 4,000, I think the limit is currently 4,000 rows in that Excel sheet. So if there are 100 errors in that, those 100 error, uh, rows are highlighted in red when you submit the sheet and it comes back to you. So you can, along with the reason, so you can identify what, which, what is the error or what is the reason for the error and the rows highlighted in red can be corrected and resubmitted. So if you have 4,000 rows and you try to throw up as a preview screen on this on the screen itself. Mm -hmm. That becomes extremely long screen to view and kind of make sense out of it. So that's the reason why we don't have a preview screen as such. I hope that makes it. Uh, I was able to answer your question, Andres. Thanks, Penny, for that. Yeah, sure. It's basically, the oh, go, go so on, Andres. Sorry about that. The, no, no. Basically, the, my concern was about the error handling. So if there is already an error handling report afterwards, should be OK. Yes, it does. It gives you back the same Excel sheet with the errors highlighted in it. Perfect. Benny, could you respond to Samuel's question there about when these updates will make their way into the main a public release? Uh, I haven't planned out on the QA side of these things yet. Uh, so, Patrick, uh, sorry, that was from Samuel. Samuel, can I reply to you offline on that? Uh, I'm not sure if it will make into the immediate release or will it be the release after that? Uh, so, let me come back to you on that. All right, thanks. Thank you, Benny. Were there any more questions from anybody in attendance? Uh, per perhaps unrelated to, the, to this particular presentation, uh, I have a general question about multi-currency. 
I'm not sure if this is the venue. You know, if you prefer, I pose this offline. But uh, uh, no, no, this is a great way to begin the discussion, Samuel, and then we could take you know it onto the mailing list if there's further conversation. But you could start it now, and Vinny would probably be one of the best people to respond. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, basically, I'm looking for you know in general. You no, know, I haven't found any documentation that specifically addressed this in detail. So maybe I'm looking in the wrong places. But I want to understand you know with what depth uh, multi-currency functionality is is uh, in the system, uh, particularly with regard to general ledger. You know, you know how how multi-currency is inter integrated into general ledger. Um, no, and if I can clarify that question any any more, I'd be happy. Okay, so, to. yeah, so I can give you a background of how the multi currencies are handled in MIPOS, and probably some thoughts on how it should be in the longer term. What we what we support today is that um, every loan account, savings account, and the corresponding uh, financial account mm -hmm. GL ledgers have the currency codes um, attached to them. Okay, so what it really means is that you can create a loan or a saving with one particular currency and the repayments are expected in the same currency. We don't, don't support uh, automatic currency conversion and um, maintaining a base currency in the software. Okay, in a core banking system that is something that is expected especially if you're working across geographies mm -hmm. that you would have a base currency and then the transactions are automatically stored in two currencies. One is the currency in which it is the transaction actually happens and then it is converted into the base currency as per the uh, existing rate and then stored. That process is not implemented in MIFOS today so we don't have those conversions and storage. Now what it means is that the reports, all reports expect the user to select the currency or is run for a specific currency because if uh, you if there are multiple transactions in different currencies and then you have it in the same report totaling and all doesn't make sense. So that is a limitation, but yeah, that, that is a state where we are in. In the longer term, what I'd like to do, this is not yet planned out and I don't have an exact release date when such a thing would be implemented, but what would be ideal to implement would be to have this conversion, a table which maintains the conversion rates which is refreshed periodically and the transactions automatically detect the exchange rate as on a particular date and then converts it to the base currency and stores it along with the transaction would be applicable for the GL ledgers also where transactions, two currencies would be maintained against a transaction, the original currency as well as the, the uh, as well as the base currency value. Did I answer do you have I, I think you do. I think that's fairly clear. Um, do you have any idea when that would be integrated, no, when uh, GL, can, I mean I'm sorry, currency conversion in the GL would be integrated? Is there it's any not, sense at all for that? Yeah, I don't have a sense of it yet. I haven't planned it out yet. Uh, with the other features that we are working on, I don't see it being available in the next three months or so. It would, if you need it immediately, it would have to be taken up as a custom development. Okay, th thank you. Uh, I have a subsequent question as well, but um, no, let me give the floor to anybody else first. I think, Samuel, if nobody else has questions, you can continue with your subsequent okay. questions. All right, thank you. Uh, no, I've, I've installed a, I, I set up a, a local version on my, on my uh, local machine. Um, and I'm having, I'm actually having trouble, I believe the install and, and set up, you know, I, I'm pretty sure everything went uh, the way it should have, My, uh, but I'm unable to log into my local database. Uh, I, if I pass the reference to the demo version, you no, know, the online demo version of the, of the, uh, the platform, then I'm able to log in correctly, but if I try and pass the reference to my local installation of the platform it doesn't work. You know, and I've gone through the law through the various log files and I, I'm, I'm not having any luck kind of resolving that issue. You no, know, so if anybody has any advice as to where I would look or you not know, particularly which log files I, I would look into, that'd be appreciated.
Oh, I, I, does your backend platform, if you run one of those APIs from the from the URL, are you able to see the JSON response back on the screen? No, I get a 404. Marcus, would you be able to answer that? What exactly is 404? I'm not technically that sound. 404 means not found, so this looks like something during the setup of the Tomcat isn't really working proper. So, um, Samuel, could you just um, take the log files from Tomcat and send it to the developer list and I could um, take a look at it and take care of it and respond to you back if I could see something? Right now it sounds a bit like there's maybe maybe the default tenant or something is missing so the complete Tomcat won't start up really. Uh, the yeah, I'll be happy to send those logs. Um, the Tomcat indicates that it started that it's correctly started. Know that that application is correctly started. No, that it's right. Yeah. But yeah, look, I'll, that's fine. I don't, I'll, I, I don't want to take up the, too much time on this on, on right. buddy's call. So I'll be happy to send those on the developer's form. Thank you. Yeah. yeah so I think Samuel. Oh yeah, just send yeah send details of what you've articulated here along with those logs on the, to the developer's mailing list, and then I think your you know your issue is probably a a common one that some folks have faced, and then you know we'll either resolve it on the mailing list there, or one of our devs or techs can jump on a quick Skype call with you to you know do a screen share and help you uh, get unblocked. So. Okay, I also have a question in respect to trying to create a JAR file on the development branch. I have put the directory, but any time I try to create a JAR file, it gives me a failure in terms of build field with an exception. Could not load, sorry, could not download the artifact called of the spring trigger, spring call release JAR. I don't know. I've never, I've not been able to. I've not been able to. I've not been able to. I've, I've not been able to uh, create a data path for now. So I don't know if uh, there's something I'm doing wrong. Oh, Marcus, I might defer to you as the developer on call. Are you able to help uh, Patrick? Do you have any advice on him trying to build the jar from his local source file? I think we should take this offline because most of the stuff he said I didn't understand because it was pretty noisy. Okay. And I would now just start guessing what he said so maybe we could take it offline and just guide for a second. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's let's do that if you if you have time to do that for a moment, Marcus. So, sure. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you uh, everyone who joined today. I'm glad we had some of our new community members on the call, and a special thank you to Antonio and Dinuge for their demos, and thank you to Marcus and Vinny for fielding the questions and giving the development updates. Our next user meetup call will be in two weeks' time, and then next week on Thursday, a couple hours earlier in the day, we have our biweekly developer meeting. So I look forward to seeing you in attendance on those. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Ed. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.